Okay, so this might uh, not end up taking the whole class, but I wanted to introduce the Richardson model of conflict. Both, well, there are, there are a few reasons I want to introduce this. The first three is in is that uh, textbooks tend to be extremely limited in the kind of applications they show or the kind of models they show for differential equations. I mean, it's basically always mixing problems, something from engineering, and then maybe an ambitious textbook author will look at a disease model. So I want to show a model um, sort of outside of those standard areas, but this is also useful because it's going to show a very standard trick for dealing with systems of differential equations that are almost homogeneous, but not quite. So uh, we'll talk about sort of moving around a fixed point. And what we're going to look at here are two countries countries X and Y. And these countries are in a state of tension with each other. So they are not in a state of war, but they are in a position where war is a possible outcome come maybe. And I mean, I say X and Y are countries. That's not quite right. X and Y are the war potentials of countries. And you can interpret that however you want. It could just be the amount of money spent on the military. It could be the size of the military. It could be some um, combination of those factors, the amount, um, but, but X and Y represent sort of the ability of these countries to wage war one against the other. And X and Y are going to change with time. And these are, the equations are going to be parallel to each other. So this isn't like the predator prey model where they the predator and the prey had different roles. Both these equations are going to be similar. So let's just work through the X DT. So we're going to start with a k times y term. And this represents exponential growth. And in particular, it represents exponential growth um, in relation to y, in relation to the other country's war potential. So if the other country doesn't have a lot of war potential, the first country won't be in a rush to build up its own war potential. But if the second country has a high war potential, the first country will build up its own war potential quickly to compensate for it.
there's going to be a negative x term. And this represents the practical reality that any country can build up its war potential by only so much. I mean, if a country's already spending 90% of its budget on its military and already has a draft or whatever, there's not a lot it can probably do to increase its ability to wage war further. So this negative X term is saying that if the country already has a very high war potential, it's going to either increase slowly or maybe even start to decrease. And then we have a grievance term. And I'll discuss the grievance term shortly, but I mean, it's basically what it sounds like. You know, if you look at the United States and Canada, we're not building up our militaries in response to each other because we don't think of each other as being our enemies. So the grievance term is just um, a statement, basically, that country X does not like country Y and anticipates that it might be in conflict with country Y and will build up its armaments at some rate in preparation for conflict with country Y, um, no matter what else is happening. And as I say, these equations are parallel. So country Y will engage in the same logic. Country Y will build up its military with respect um, in relation to what country X is doing. Countries wise, war potential will be limited, though it's only able to build up so much in terms of armament. And there's some grievance term between country X and country Y that causes country Y to build up its military, even if country X isn't doing anything. And of course, this model, let me give a little background. Um, of course, this model is simple. I mean, any model we look at in a classroom is going to be simple, but it does have some power to it. In particular, since like the time of the ancient Greeks, People have sort of disagreed with each other about why people would go to war. So like in World War I, um, if you look at the sort of parliamentarians and diplomats and you look at what people were saying when World War I was sort of um, happening, when it was breaking out, you had some sort of politicians making speeches and they were saying, oh, it's so tragic. Everyone built up their military because they thought it would prevent war from happening. But actually it had the opposite effect because it just made everyone else build up their military until war was basically inevitable. And then you have other people saying, no, no, no. I mean, World War I happened because countries essentially didn't like each other, because some countries had territory that other countries thought they should have instead. And that's why the war happened and the buildup of the armies was just a side effect of that. So two very different 
philosophies are two very different thought processes, but this model can catch both of them. You just make um, terms bigger or smaller, depending on how important you think they are. So if you're in the second camp, that the war happened because people were occupying other people's countries and that just made hostility build up and build up. You can reflect that by making the grievance terms large. If you think that the grievances didn't really matter and that and that the war was just a result of countries building up their armaments until there really wasn't any way to de-escalate. You make the K and the L terms large and the grievance terms small. So this model has power to it in spite of being somewhat elementary. I should also make, I mean, this might be obvious, but I should probably explicitly say that Richardson did not believe in like mathematical predestination. Like Richardson did not think you could find K alpha G L beta H and then plug them in and predict whether a war would break out. The point Richardson was trying to make here, Richardson was a pacifist and the point he was trying to make was that you can't rely you can't just let stuff happen and assume that everything will work out in the end. When Richardson is predicting that a war will break out, what he's predicting is that if the countries don't recognize the trajectory they're on and then the course correct, maybe a war will break out. So Richardson certainly didn't think he could predict the future with this model. Let's talk a little about the grievance terms. Let's talk a little about G and H. In particular, for this classroom, we're going to make an assumption. We're going to assume that G and H are constants, that grievance is pretty much fixed. And in the real world, I think it's probably more accurate to say that grievance terms are piecewise constant. And you can absolutely analyze the Richardson model with piecewise constant grievance terms. It becomes more complicated though. Either you're, um, you're using a computer or you're doing fancier stuff by hand than I want to get into. But what do I mean by piecewise constant, okay? I'm going to give two examples and I'm going to pick one example from each side of the political spectrum so that nobody feels like I'm picking on them. And both of these examples happened relatively recently. I mean, within the last decade. And we'll look at America's um, grievance terms. 
Oh, again, that's that's another sort of thing where it's very weird to say a country, a democracy like America. Oh, we all agree on which country. I mean, of course we don't. So there's another simplifying assumption I'm making. But let's look at Russia. So I think it's fair to say that for most of my life, I mean, obviously, I'm not so old that I was around during the Cold War. I think it's fair to say that for most of my life, most Americans had relatively little opinion on Russia. I mean, it was maybe a country because people kind of abstract disliked because they sort of have remnants of the Cold War paranoia. And also, I mean, I don't want to sugarcoat stuff because Russia did stuff that, that caused people to feel negatively about them. So I would say that our grievance term was kind of going along and going along. And then the, what year was it? Well, the Trump Clinton presidential election happened and the Democratic Party lost very badly. And in my opinion, was looking for scapegoats looking for a reason to say, well, we lost, but it wasn't our fault. And what at least some liberals came up with was the idea that, oh, well, Trump's making alliances with Russia, and he's sort of politically in bed with Putin, and it's all Russia's fault. And suddenly a lot of Americans who didn't have any strong opinion about Russia were now blaming Russia for their political difficulties. And that could be represented in the Richardson model with a jump in grievance people who didn't really think of Russia one way or the other were suddenly thinking of Russia as the enemy. Yeah. Um, from the other side of the political spectrum, just so the Democrats in the room don't think I'm picking on them, we can look at our relationship with China. And it's, in my opinion, a very similar situation where our relationship with China basically was what it was for years on end. And then the COVID outbreak happened. And again, well, again, this is only my opinion, but just like I think the Democrats sort of scapegoated Russia for their failures. I think the Republican administration was looking for an excuse, looking for a reason that they were handling the COVID epidemic so badly. And they responded by trying to scapegoat China. You know, if you heard Trump or other politicians talk about sort of the China disease and stuff like that. So our relationship with China had been sort of going along without changing. When, again, suddenly a large portion of America is now suddenly blaming China for their problems. And again, I think that can be represented as an abrupt jump in the grievance terms. So in general, I think grievance terms look like I mean, you can look at, this is going way back, but 9-11, you know, we sort of had these Mid-Eastern countries that we didn't like, but weren't really 
host and openly hostile towards, I mean, Iraq and Afghanistan, obviously, and then 9-11 happened. They were, again, this is just my opinion, but I think they were made scapegoats of and grievance terms jumped. So stuff like that happens. Grievance terms aren't really constant, what I think tends to happen instead is that grievance terms are constant for long periods of time until something major happens and they jump. I mean, going back to Russia, I think we've seen our grievance with Russia jump twice in our lifetime after Russia invaded Ukraine. A lot of Americans were, of course, very unhappy with that. And the grievance term again, just sort of suddenly went up. But we'll, uh, we'll be treating grievance as constant, again, just for simplicity. And we'll be doing a fixed point analysis. <laughs> and I'm going to hand wave some of the details because they aren't super interesting, but I'll tell you at least um, how we find the fixed points. We'll set the first equation equal to zero. And then we have to send the second set the second equation equal to zero as well. And I mean, this is a system of linear equations. We can, well, our calculator won't do it, but I mean, theoretically, our calculator won't do it because we have constants instead of numbers. But I mean, this is the kind of thing we can do that we can solve. If we wanted to solve it without our calculator, what we could do is we could go to this first equation. We could solve for one of the variables, solve the first equation for y, let's say. Then once we've solved for y, we can stick it in there. And now the second equation only involves x. Lx minus beta, alpha x minus g over k, plus h equals zero. And we can solve for x from here. And similarly, if we wanted to solve for y using this method, we could go back to the first equation. We could solve for x instead of solving for y. And then we could plug that into the second equation. And there is a fixed point. x zero, y zero equals ugly fixed point, which is why I've said that I don't want to show all of the details, but there's x zero. And there's y zero. And 
And our options are going to be ultimately that this fixed point can be asymptotically stable or it can be unstable. I mean, we have to uh, we have to verify that. We have to do eigenvalue analysis and stuff. But um, let's just talk about what those mean in this context. Um, this is a situation where both countries have basically settled on the amount of war potential they want to devote to the other country. And if this is asymptotically stable, they're just going to settle into an armed peace, which is obviously not great but is certainly better than war. If the state, if the fixed point is unstable, then their war potential is going to build and build and build without ever slowing down. And Richardson would understand that as meaning that war was inevitable. You can't have two countries sitting next to each other and just drafting soldiers and building up their army and building new weapons. You can't just keep doing that forever and still maintain a state of peace. Or at least Richardson would say that you couldn't. I don't know as far as like the history of the world. I don't know if he's right about that or not. But there's our fixed point. And because it's so complicated, we're going to hand wave the details and we'll just refer to X zero and Y zero when we want to talk about the fixed point. So this differential equation, the system of differential equations is actually a linear. It, that, it's a rare beast. I've said that most real world interesting differential equations aren't linear, but this is a constant in front of X, a constant in front of Y. It isn't homogeneous. And it's not homogeneous because we've got that term that doesn't have an X or an H, but um, it is linear and a linear differential equation can be rewritten. I think orange is not terribly visible. Let's go back to X. This differential equation says that xy prime equals, then we can rewrite a linear equation using matrix multiplication. This matrix times xy plus G H. And in addition to thinking this model, just because it's kind of a non traditional application of differential equations, I like it because this situation is fairly common, where you almost have, I mean, if it weren't for that term, we would be golden. We could find the eigenvalues of this. I mean, it's doing this in generality, obviously kind of messy, bring a lot of scrap 
paper, but we could find the eigenvalues and look at the eigenvalues and that would be all there is. So, um, this GH term is kind of a nuisance. And I mean, in one sense, I guess we don't need to deal with it. I mean, what we could do is, I mean, we could find the Jacobian of this. The G and the H would both go away when we take derivatives. So we could find the Jacobian of this. We could plug the fixed points in and we could try to go from there. I'm going to show a second very standard way of dealing with something that looks like this though. Let me name some stuff just so I don't have to keep writing these things over and over. Let's call this vector W. Let's call this matrix A. Let's call this vector F. Then what we've got here is W prime equals A times W plus F. And an extremely common trick when you have something that looks like this and you have a fixed point is to define a new variable, which is your old variable minus the fixed point. And before we do anything else, let's consider what, why we're doing this and what we hope to accomplish here. We've got a linear differential equation. It's not homogeneous, but it's almost homogeneous. It's just got that constant term. So we've got this fixed point, it's whatever it is. It's maybe it's, I mean, we'll figure out what it is, but for now, let's say it's whatever. It's a saddle. So what we have here, minusing this constant vector is just a shift. We're taking our phase plane and we're shifting it around. And in particular, what we're going to do is we're taking this phase plane and we're, let me use a different color for that. We're shifting it so that that fixed point is going to lie on the origin. We're just taking the entire picture and we're moving it this way. So what's this mean? Well, now we have a, uh, a big line of equalities. Let's try to take them one by one. Z prime equals W prime. That's because um, the only difference between Z and W is a constant, W zero, and the derivative of a constant is zero. Well, W prime equals A W plus F. That is just this statement here that I've bracketed. 
equals A. Times Z plus W zero plus F. So I've replaced W with Z plus W zero. And that is able to happen because of that equation that I just bracketed. We add W zero to both sides and we find that Z plus W zero equals W. So we took this and we plugged it in for W. This is A Z plus A W zero plus F. Here we're just distributing A times Z plus W zero. That multiplication distributes over the addition. And now, one of the less obvious steps, let me give myself some room here. This is A, Z. A, W, zero plus F equals zero. And this is because, I mean, what was this W zero? It was a fixed point of A, C plus or A W plus F. So we're using the fact we've got W prime equals A W plus F. W zero is a fixed point. By definition, the fixed point makes the derivative be zero. So A W zero plus F is zero because it's a fixed point. And being a fixed point makes the derivative zero. So C prime equals A C. And then because this differential equation, Z prime equals A Z, and this W prime equals A W plus F, these are the same phase thing, except that one of them has been moved around a bit. So the pictures are the same, they're just in different places. So in particular, the stability of the fixed point at the origin of Z prime equals AZ, and the stability and type of the fixed point there are going to be the same. Is that an argument that makes sense to everybody? Then I'm going to the uh, the characteristic polynomial is not that bad looking, but I'm I'm still going to spare you the details. 
And I mean, well, it's not that bad looking because A, I mean, we're just looking at negative alpha minus lambda, K, L, negative beta minus lambda. We're just subtracting the diagonals and we're subtracting the anti-diagonals and we're subtracting them. I mean, there's no reason it should be particularly ugly. And after you simplify everything, it's lambda squared plus alpha plus beta lambda plus alpha beta minus k l. A third reason that I like introducing the Richardson model is that it gives students the opportunity to see the kind of eigenvalue analysis that you see a lot in journal papers or maybe slightly more advanced textbooks. I mean, because like, if we want to say what we think alpha and beta and K and L are, then determining the stability of the fixed point is the easiest thing in the world. You solve a quadratic and then you interpret your results. You get two real roots and they're both positive, so it's an unstable node or whatever. It's more difficult to try to do that when we have a bunch of constants floating around, alphas and betas and k's and l's. But we're nevertheless going to try to decide um, what this fixed point looks like and what its stability is in general, just by looking at this and trying to be clever. So the first thing we can do, I mean, we can certainly find the eigenvalues, we set that equal to zero. And we hit it with the quadratic formula. The problem, of course, is then trying to interpret this answer. Like we've got under the square root, we've got something minus something else. So our first thought is maybe that the roots can be real or the roots can be complex. It just depends on the relative sizes of that term and that term. If the first expression is bigger, then we have real roots. If the second expression is bigger, then we have complex roots. So that's maybe what it looks like at first glance. But let's, um, let's pick apart. What we have under that square root. Alpha squared plus two alpha beta plus beta squared minus four 
alpha, beta, thus for KL. For well, that thus two alpha beta and that minus for uh, four alpha beta, you know, simplify. So that's erase this and let's turn that thus two into a minus two. Those first three terms can, um, can be factored. This is alpha minus beta squared plus four times K times L. And this is secretly having us a lot. Um, all of the terms here, I never, I didn't explicitly say this, I should have said it. When we have these models, we generally just assume that all of the parameters are strictly positive. Like looking at this model, it, it wouldn't make any sense if K were negative. If K were negative, it would mean that we see the other country building up its military and we reduce the size of our own military in response. So K alpha, L beta, G, H, they are all positive. Um, it doesn't really make sense for any of them to be zero either. Like if G were zero and H were zero, well, that's back to the situation I talked about, you know, the United States and Canada. It doesn't make sense to use this model if there's not some grievance between the countries. So if K and L are both positive, then this is greater than zero. Because four times a positive number times another positive number is positive. Alpha minus beta squared might be zero, but it can't be negative. A square can never be negative. So a positive number times a non plus, sorry, a positive number plus a non-negative number is strictly positive. And that tells us a bunch of stuff. It tells us that we have two distinct real roots. I mean, I said a bunch of stuff, and then I said the one thing it tells us, but that one thing is important. It means that the fixed point can't be a spiral, the fixed point can't be a center, and the fixed point can't be an improper or a proper node. So our options have been abruptly reduced. The fixed point is either an unstable saddle or it's an asymptotically stable node or it's an unstable node. Those are the only three possibilities. Does everybody agree with this so far? Then let's go back. This rewriting what was under the square root was very useful and very fruitful. But I would like to go back to that as our next form of analysis. Um, well, let me actually say we can do, e without doing anything further, we can do even better. 
I've said that our fixed point is either an asymptotically stable node, it's an unstable node, or it's a saddle. We can get rid of one of these cases. This cannot be an unstable node. To be an unstable node, would it? We need two positive eigenvalues. Well, going back to here, the eigenvalue we get from subtraction is clearly negative. I mean, I shouldn't say clearly. It's clear to me because I did the problem before class. I mean, but we have a negative number, negative alpha plus beta minus a positive number. Square roots are always positive. A negative number times a positive number is negative. Divide it by two, it's still negative. So we definitely have at least one negative eigenvalue. So in fact, there are only two possible cases. This fixed point could be a saddle. in which case it's unstable. And remember that a saddle comes from having a positive and a negative eigenvalue. Uh, we're gonna be using these words a lot in the coming lecture. So if on the test you struggled with like confusing different types of fixed points, that would be a good thing to nail down over this long weekend. Um, the other possibility is that we have a no, would it? And a node could be unstable or asymptotically stable, but we ruled one of those cases out. If we have a node, it's because both our eigenvalues are negative and the node is asymptotically stable. And we've now ruled out everything that's possible to rule out. These are two cases that can both legitimately happen, but that doesn't mean we can't say anything else. Let's, um, let's try to talk about when we're in the first case versus when we're in the second case. And the deciding factor is going to be alpha beta minus KL. Whether this is greater than zero or less than zero is going to be the deciding factor between um, between the cases. And as I say that, I actually don't know what happens if alpha B minus KL is exactly equal to zero, but that's not, that's not an interesting case. I mean, just because if, I mean, if you think of alpha, beta, K and L, you've got four real numbers. What are the chances that you take two of them and you multiply them, and then you take the other two and you multiply them, and they're exactly the same? I mean, the probability is zero in a very formal sense. 
Yes. So we don't let that last case trouble us. So if these are less than zero, then alpha plus beta squared is less than alpha plus beta squared minus four times alpha beta minus KL. And that is because if this is less than zero, this is negative. And subtracting a negative is the same as addition. So now that inequality makes sense. The square is less than the square plus something. Four is less than four plus three, you know. And then the square root is monotonic. So I'll give you chance to write this down because I know it's easy for me to erase and mess around on the whiteboard, but you still have to copy your stuff into your notes. So when I say the square root is monotonic, I mean, I guess monotonic's a word we used in calculus. Um, it sounds very fancy. It, it just means that the small, that the square root of a small number is less than the square root of a big number. The square root of four is less than the square root of a hundred. So on the left, the square root and the square cancel, and alpha plus beta is less than this square root. And this tells us that we have a um that we have a positive eigenvalue. And that might not be obvious. So let's, let's look at this with specific numbers. Say that this is three and this is seven. Then negative Three plus seven is positive. And negative three plus seven divided by two is positive. So this number, the alpha plus beta, being less than the square root means that if you tack a negative sign in front of the alpha plus beta and then add the square root, the result is positive. Is that, does that, is that argument clear? So if you then look, I mean, this alpha plus beta, this square root, these both showed up in the quadratic formula. So the statement that out negative alpha plus, where was I? Here I was.
So this, this statement then says that this numerator is positive. And then a positive number divided by two is positive. So one of the eigenvalues is positive. We already made the argument that one of the eigenvalues is negative. So one of them is positive, the other is negative. This is a saddle. And it's unstable. And this is the situation that Richardson thought would lead to war, that it would lead to the countries building their militaries up without bound until war was inevitable. Now, sometimes when you see models like this, I mean, this situation where um, I'll talk about what happens if alpha beta minus KL was positive in a moment. I want to get to something else first. Sometimes you see papers and like models where we have these restrictions and we have these statements that like this combination of parameters means that something is unstable and it's impossible to understand why kind of on an intuitive level. I generally find that stuff to not be super interesting. If it's trying to look at a real world situation, you should be able to interpret what you find in real world terms. Now, that is not the case here. Alpha beta being less than KL leading to war is a very intuitive concept. And that's because K and L are both promoting military build up. If you go way back, you see A is here. Country X sees country Y building up its military, so it builds its military up in return. Similarly, L. Country Y sees country X building up its military, so it builds its military up in return. Now, by contrast, now by contrast, alpha and beta are both opposing military build up. Alpha and beta are the terms where country X says, well, our military can't get any stronger without imposing a draft. And we don't want to do that, so we can't build our military up further. So alpha and beta are preventing military build up. So say that K and L are both big. And alpha and beta are both small. 
then K times L will be big and alpha times beta will be small. So alpha times beta will be less than the K times L. And we predict that war will occur. So this model is making the very intuitive statement that if the factors promoting war are big and the factors preventing war are small, then war is likely to occur. It's very intuitive. Now we are sort of low on time. Um, if we if we reverse these, we wind up with the other case, an asymptotically stable node. Um, so this is saying that, again, this is hopefully a very intuitive statement. If the factors that prevent military buildup are greater than the factors that promote military buildup, war will hopefully not occur. We'll settle into armed peace. And I mean, I think this is where most nations are. I mean, obviously Russia kind of shocked the world by, um, by invading the Ukraine, but like America and China, you know, they don't like each other, but they're at the point where they can't build their militaries up enough that it would ever be possible for one of those nations to defeat the other nation. So we just have to go on not liking each other. I mean, sort of mutually assured destruction um, if we did anything else. So, I mean, in spite of being kind of, um, obviously kind of simple, in spite of the fact that I treated grievance terms as if they were constants when they really aren't. I do think this is a pretty accurate uh, depiction of what we see. And in particular, and this is interesting, let me say it explicitly, the grievance terms have no effect on whether countries go to war or not. You'll see whether, I mean, we see this armed peace, it's entirely in terms of alpha, beta, K, and L. The grievance terms aren't affecting whether we're in this case or in this case. And again, that's that's very, I think, at least for like I, my my world knowledge isn't enough for me to talk intelligently about like Africa or South America, but like at least in North America, at least in Europe, at least in Asia, that's basically true. Like you don't aside again, this is maybe in part why it was so shocking aside from Russia eventually just deciding they were going to take another country due to long standing grievances they have with it. We really don't see countries just deciding we hate each other so much, there is no choice but to fight. Um, that's not something we tend to see in, in mo the modern world. So I think it's probably quite accurate 
that the grievance terms aren't showing up here. And that's, I, I thought it might be a short lecture, but it wasn't. It's almost exactly uh, our allotted class time. So we, uh, of course, would not meet Monday anyway, but I hope, I mean, presumably you all know that there are no classes Monday. Um, so I hope you all have an enjoyable long weekend.